This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. When climate change hits the fragile just in time grocery system, where will your food come from? How long can you eat? You probably have house insurance or renter's insurance and car insurance, so why don't you have food insurance? Our next guest has helped Americans prepare with emergency food stocks for almost 30 years. He's a homesteader, a wise blogger at survivalacres.com and now at foodassets.com. From somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, Jonathan Richards, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Good morning and thank you, Alex. So what does it mean to be a prepper? Well, Prepping is kind of a way of life, of just doing basic essential preparations to make sure that you have some resiliency in your home and for your family. It doesn't require um, a great deal of money or time if you do it wisely and carefully. One of the things that I've been involved with is with food preparations and having food set aside for storms, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, disasters, anything like that is a pretty smart idea. Americans used to prep and have their food preps on hand for quite a long time, uh, but that kind of changed when we moved to supermarkets in this country. And the supermarket made it so easy and convenient for people to just run down to the store and buy the food that they need. However, when there's been a disaster, the supermarket shelves get wiped out pretty quickly, uh, sometimes in just a matter of hours. So having something on hand is always a good idea, and you can, you can do that by stocking up your pantry. Yes, we live in a rural area, and so if we do go to a city at all, we really stock up, and then we joke that our store is in our basement. We go down to the store downstairs and and bring things up from there. But, you know, in these times, there are a lot of people in cities who seldom cook. They're relying on fast food and restaurants, and apparently tens of millions of real Americans could barely afford food, much less stocking up. They're just looking for the next meal for their kids. So, Jonathan, I'm wondering, is prepping just for the middle and upper class people? Well, actually, I don't think the middle and upper class are doing much prepping anymore. It's it's almost always been the lower class people that have struggled to pay their bills. For some reason, they seem to be a little bit more aware of the need to be prepared. Um, maybe it's because they don't have the money to survive disasters, so they set things aside. Um, they get tuned into the whole issue of being prepared a little more readily than the middle and upper class. And I base that all upon all these decades of being involved in this industry. We've seen a dramatic decline in the ability for people to buy and prepare with food preparations. And I've been in touch with canneries and different suppliers around the country, and they've seen the same thing. So I think it's actually the lower classes, uh, the people that are having less money, less ability to uh, have a disposable income, that have been making preparations over the years. There are some of the upper middle classes that are doing it, but it's nowhere near what some of the hype and propaganda that you may have seen published. Later, I want to get to the big picture reasons why our listeners may want to collect a basic stock of food and water, but for those in a rush, what are the most popular options to get started on a food insurance policy? I would always recommend buy what you eat. It's been kind of the mantra that I've been speaking about for decades. Uh, Don't buy strange foods. Don't fall for different advertising campaigns that try to convince you that you need this or you need that. Buy what you actually eat. That's always the best and smartest move because if you won't eat it, it doesn't do you any good, and you wind up wasting some of your money. But the other thing is you can buy your staples. Staples come in bulk quantities. They're fairly inexpensive. They last a long time. You can get upwards of 30 years out of some of these staples, and you can prepare them relatively easily, and they go really far. So um, you can take out just a, a little bit that you need, prepare a meal from it, and store the rest away, even for decades. So the staples that I recommend are things like pastas, rice, potatoes, uh, some, some grains that you like to eat. My wife and I, we always eat oat groats almost every single day. Um, It's healthy for us, especially at my age. And they're not that expensive to purchase. And we we doll them up, you know, with blueberries and pumpkin seeds and things like that, you know, to make them um, a little bit more delicious. But if you buy your staples and you learn to prepare these foods and use them on a daily basis, then you'll have never wasted any of your money. 
And how much food does it really take per person to stay alive beyond the three-day supply the American government usually recommends? Do we need a basement to put it in? Can we get it in a closet? I mean, what sort of mass are we talking about here? Well, if you're buying the type of food that I'm speaking of, which is dehydrated food, it's very compact and and nutritionally dense, so it doesn't take up a huge amount of space. Uh, Even a one-year food supply will fit into a very small closet of about six feet tall and about two feet wide. And you can actually get a one-person, one-year food supply from dehydrated food lines that will fit into that space. But if you want to get like a three-month or, say, six-month food supply, you know, you could put that into your pantry really easily or even under your bed. It'll store without refrigeration, and the amount of space required is actually minimal. Ten years ago, when the world financial crisis shook the faith in the system, I put away a year's worth of wheat and rice, among other things. And the hard, unprocessed wheat berries can last decades or more, maybe even centuries if stored properly, as the Egyptians did. But the rice I'm not so sure about. So next month, as I told you, I'm going to crack up one of my buckets of rice. It's sealed airtight in a mylar bag, and I packed it with oxygen depletion sacks. Jonathan, do you expect that rice will still be edible now, 10 years later? Actually, I do. Uh, White rice can have a shelf life of 30 years. And so it depends on how you packaged it and whether it was kept in a cool, cool, dark location and if it was actually airtight. But it does sound like you did do that, so you should be able to expect it, be able to open that rice and eat it. I wouldn't expect there to be any issues. I myself have had open containers that would be both buckets and cans, that's the number 10 cans, that I've eaten out of for decades. They've been opened and used little by little by little because I can't eat you know, that much at one time. I simply take out what I want and put the lid back on and forget about it. But it's not, you know, the humidity in this area is not real bad. I'm not too far from you, so I would expect you to have the same type of performance. Yes, it's down in a a cold basement, but it never freezes, and of course it never sees the light. I do like rice and canned seafood because in an emergency, both can be eaten without cooking. You just soak the rice overnight to get a mealy but nutritious food. I guess there are a lot of foods like that. If we didn't, say, have electricity for our electric stove, we still need to eat it somehow. Yeah, most dehydrated food requires uh, preparation and cooking, but it's actually relatively simple to do. I advocated using pressure cookers for years to cut down the cooking time, the preparation time. But there are other techniques. There's things called an instant pot uh, available now that can reduce the cooking time quite dramatically. You can prepare a meal in about 30 minutes with that. The other things you can do is to soak the dehydrated food in the water um, and let that sit. Or you can even do what's called thermos cooking. You can take hot water and add that to a thermos and add in your dehydrated foods and just let it sit, and it'll cook by itself. So, you know, it's almost a hands-free operation. And we know the Mormon Church used to require believers to stock up to three years' worth of food. They've since cut that back. And I learned a lot by watching YouTube videos with Mormon women showing how they did it, and I recommend that to anybody who's interested in food storage. Jonathan, talk to us about the role of religion and preparing emergency food stocks. Well, the Mormon Church does have that doctrine, and I've been aware of that for some time, and I I think that they've changed that now to about a one-year food supply. But I'm not sure. I'm not not a member, but I suppose it's probably been reduced since then. For the most part, religion has always played a role in people being prepared because that has actually been where most of the customers wind up coming from. They're from one church or another, one group from another and sometimes from some businesses, and they when they want to get their employees properly prepared. But we have, in, that, in fact, seen um, a big surge in customers over the many years that were uh, buying food from uh, religious organizations. However, we've also been in co- contact with FEMA and other organizations that have been preparing hospitals and state agencies to uh, get the people in their areas uh, properly prepared, and oftentimes they'll come to us even asking for advice. So. It's not just religion that has a role in being prepared. It's something that everybody should do, every American, every Canadian. You really don't want to always be 100% dependent upon the supermarkets. And unfortunately, that's, that's the reality. We live in a situation where if the supermarkets empty out, we're in trouble. And we need to do something about that. 
What would you say are the biggest prepper mistakes? Well, that's a big list, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. I think a lot of preppers don't buy what they actually eat. Uh, that's one of the one of the big issues that I think that they run into. They purchase foods that, that sound good, and they never try them out, so they never get the experience of actually eating that food. They also don't do enough research. If you don't research what you're actually going to be purchasing, and I, I don't care where you get that from, you may not be getting the nutrition and the calories that you actually require because, you know, there's a big difference between a sedentary lifestyle and an active lifestyle. If we really were in a collapse situation or a crisis situation where there was something big and bad that had happened, you know, you're not going to be able to just sit around. You're going to be active in doing things, you know, looking out for yourself, looking out for your family, maybe cleaning up from storm debris, that sort of thing. So you've got to have enough nutrition on hand, and that's probably a big area that people need to really think about. And you have a section on your blog about food scams that people who want to get prepared food should watch out for. Can you tell us about one or two? Yes, I can. I won't mention any names, but one of the things that I've seen with the food scams is the misrepresentation on the food kit sizes. Usually they're nutritionally deficient and they won't last anywhere near the advertised claims. Um, Perhaps the ad will say something like, this is a one-year food supply. But when you calculate out the actual nutrition using their own published figures, you'll discover that it can be extremely poorly represented. It may only last three months. And so you would actually require like three or four of those same units, which makes them extremely expensive if you were to purchase that and assume it was going to last for a whole year. That's probably one of the bigger scams that we see. And how would you characterize the state of the prepper industry? I mean, are things flourishing? Are things getting neglected? What's going on? Actually, I believe that the prepper industry has been seriously co-opted, and it's actually in a type of collapse in itself right now. There's been a number of companies and even canneries go out of business because there's been so little interest in preparing, or it's because there's the economic decline is so severe, one or the other. But we've seen a tremendous decline, uh, upwards of 95% of people making preparation for the future. The other thing that I've seen is a blending of the prepper meme and the survivalist meme. They used to be separated. Uh, The survivalists were actually interested in practical skills and learning to actually live off the land directly, uh, what you might even call primitive living and practicing that sort of survival techniques. But the prepping meme came into vogue, and a lot of newcomers showed up in the last dozen or so years. And unfortunately, I'll say they polluted the whole effort, and they took everything into who could make the most money, the most profits as quickly as possible. And I think it did a lot of damage. And we're still suffering from that right now because people got really burned out on a lot of the fear-mongering, the paranoia, the xenophobia, um, and, of course, the profit. Uh, oriented motives that showed up everywhere. Do you think preppers are more aware of developing climate dangers or are more climate-aware folks starting to consider deep adaptation options? I don't think the prepper movement is is keenly aware of climate change. There are some, but what I have seen and, and what I have noticed by visiting some of the forums and blogs is that there's still a lot of derision to climate change. I'm really confused by that because I actually believe that climate change is the number one existential threat to humanity right now. So I don't think the prepper movement has really caught on to the reality of climate change in a big way. What I have seen for those that have are individuals that have taken the time to study the science, to study the published reports, and they will call and ask questions and mention it. But you'd be surprised at how many people still send us emails regarding the whole climate change topic. You know, they're making fun of it, which is really kind of sad because, you know, to step outside and see what's happening, it's real. Yes, indeed. And we have a lot of scientists on this show who explain why it's happening. On the prepper idea, I wonder if that whole ideal of the brave individual or family surviving while the rest of society collapses – Maybe that ideal is actually helping to prop up what is really a dying system. Your thoughts? Well, 
we're all embedded within the system. You know, um, every, everyone that lives in first world countries are particularly because we are 100% dependent upon the survival of civilization, what we call the system. And we're not as independent as we like to think. In a way, yes, we are propping up the dying system because it is contracting, it is collapsing. I've written tons of articles uh, on that very topic, but we have no choice. We are stuck with one foot in and one foot out. So what we do contributes to ecological collapse by the virtue of us just having to buy the consumer goods to keep us alive. And so we're in a position where we are going to make these contributions whether we like it or not because we don't have a support system that we can turn to that will sustain us. We can't grow our own food like we think. We can't just quit our jobs and stay home and and live on our land and survive. We are committed to being a part of what civilization actually is, and we really don't have a choice about that. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are listening to the Radio EcoShock Show. I'm your host, Alex Smith. With me on the phone is American blogger and survival food expert, Jonathan Richards. We're talking about why we all need food insurance. So, of course, there's another side to the prepper coin. We should be prepared to sit out an emergency in our homes and local communities. But, as you know and I know, we should also be prepared to get out quick with a few necessary supplies living in the Northwest. We know how fast a wildfire can come over the horizon. How do we prepare to leave? It depends on what you want to define as leave. Uh, If the wildfire situation, like what happened in Paradise or what happened in Redding, California, and and even further than that was uh, Santa Rosa, both of these cities burned over uh, rather badly, and people tried to escape, and they had so little warning that many people actually died in the flames, and that was just a horrible tragedy. So leaving when you have a threat like that is definitely going to be important. You need to be prepared with both your car and your emergency supplies on hand and ready to go, but you also need some place to go to. You and I both live in the uh, the Northwest where there's a a tremendous threat of forest fires. I've mapped out several escape routes uh, that could get us away from here into a safe location. But then when you get there, you're going to have to have your supplies on hand in order to survive while you're there. Now, most people have ideas that they're going to be able to to bug out, maybe even go into the woods, uh, given a certain kind of crisis or civil war or something like that. But I've always advocated against that type of thing because it doesn't make any sense. What people need to do is to go for help. That is always the best advice. Always go for help. Go where there are civilization. Go where you can get assistance whether our food supplies, medical supplies, and help. Otherwise, you're going to put yourself into a refugee situation, and that never turns out very well. Let me tell a story of how an emergency food cache of mine got tested by accident. When my wife and I purchased our lot in a rural village, we weren't quite ready to move here yet, and there was an ancient mobile home on it. And I ran into a poor guy who was incapacitated with a serious heart problem, We agreed to let him stay in that old trailer for a few months while he recovered. So I'm going out the door, and I mentioned, hey, there's a five-gallon bucket of rice in the closet and a stack of flats of soup, 12 cans to a flat. There's vegetable soup and mushroom soup. And that was it. I went back to the city. So he was pretty sick without any real income, and he lived on that for almost two months. And afterwards, (laughs) of course, he said, I'm never going to eat rice again. But (laughs) my point is... You said to me in an email, we don't always have to wait for the collapse. Sometimes collapse comes to us personally, whether it's losing a job or illness or just old age. What do you think? Well, I think your story is amazing, actually, that you were willing to help someone like that. Uh, I want to I want to congratulate you for doing the right thing. And that's what a lot of people don't seem to realize, that uh, personal collapse is what happens first and foremost, even in a hurricane. It's you that is affected. But even if it's not you, it can be somebody else, and that person may need some help. And you may not have the money or even, say, the fuel or even the time to assist them, but if you can hand them something to eat and get them through another day, you've done a great good. So 
when personal collapse happens, um, if you've got supplies set aside, you know, if you've got the means in order to take care of yourself or even someone else or to share what you have as the need arises, you've done the right thing. But by not doing that, by not making preparations, then everyone is more and more reliant upon the external system to keep them alive. And if they don't have immediate access to it, then people suffer. And you can, you can prevent that by being prepared. Right. It amazes me that some people who are very worried about authoritarian government, whether they're on the left or the right, you know, libertarian, whatever, don't think about their total dependence for the next day's meals on that same system. And so I think part of freedom is to be able to grow at least some of your own food and to store some of your food so that you're not totally connected to every authoritarian move that comes along. That's definitely true, but, you know, freedom comes at a price in in reality. Um, if you want freedom, then you have to maintain a very high level of independence. Regarding growing your own food, it's an enormous amount of work. I built a commercial greenhouse and a large garden space here with automatic watering systems, and I swiftly discovered just how difficult it really was, um, especially up here with our short growing season to grow sufficient numbers of, of calories. What ends up happening is I have a, I have a short growing season, despite having the, the greenhouse, I get this huge harvest that I have to immediately process as fast as I possibly can. And either I, I can it, I pickle it, I dry it, I do something with it, and I eat a lot of it. But the reality is I cannot grow all my own food. It, I can't even get close to it. I'm not even growing 25% of it, not, not in reality. I know what you're talking about. I tried to do the same thing in almost northern Ontario back in the 80s, and we did have 40 acres cleared. I had a tractor. I tried really hard, but there was no way that we were growing more than, well, like you say, about 25% of our food. So it's it's difficult even when you're young and able and harder as you get older. And I think to a degree there is a new topic that's going to come up as the boomers age, and that is almost uh, prepping for age, I mean, it, it's very much like a system collapse as your body starts to be able to do less. You have less energy. Maybe you have less brain power to cope with things. And so I'm wondering if there's a way that we can prepare for that. Well, you can and you can't, unfortunately, because um, as you have reduced capabilities as you age, and that's just a fact of life, you become more and more dependent upon uh, facility and services and assistance. Uh, what you can do is make make preparations for for the basics and the essentials, you know, which is the same thing you would do if you were younger. But being in a community where you can have help is going to be of the utmost importance. Um, making sure that you're always going to have access to critical supplies like water and heat. Up here in the Northwest, our winters can be pretty brutal. The summers are not real bad if you can get a little bit of shade during the hottest part of the year. But uh, in the wintertime, without heat, you will freeze to death. So you want to make sure that you have access to those essentials, no matter what age you really are. But as a senior citizen, it's something that I've been thinking about. Is I'm I'm slowly approaching. Um, I'm in middle age right now, but I'm slowly approaching that senior citizen timeline, and um, I'm going to reduce my footprint so I have less to maintain, less to take care of, and I'm going to surround myself by family members that can also keep an eye out for me. So do you think we would realize if our system is collapsing, if it happened in a kind of a slow motion, things falling apart? Well, heck, part of the U.S. government is shut down as we talk right now, and there's all sorts of people who are working three jobs, barely having a life. But would we know if it's really collapsing? It's collapsing right now. It's it's in contraction right now. We're geared to see opportunity, but not systemic problems. And there's been a number of uh, studies that have pointed this out. So, you know, we are not in a uh, suitable mindset as humans to understand how collapse actually works. Um, we have a lot of cognitive dissonance that takes place within us in regards to uh, the things that we believe and the things that are actually true. We have systemic risk. We've got geographical risk. We've got vector risk, density risk. These are factors that are occurring right now by the way that we designed and built civilization and how it's currently collapsing. Economically speaking, as you say, you know, there's a lot of homeless people. There's a lot of people that are really suffering. They're having to work multiple jobs. That's collapse. 
that's collapsed right there on that front alone. If you followed my blog at all, I spend a, a great deal of time documenting the climate collapse issues that are happening all over the world. Um, that's in, indeed happening, and it's going to accelerate faster and faster. Yeah, like the extreme hitting Australia right now, that just blew my mind because they've had very hot years already and now setting new records. I just almost don't know what to think about what's going on there. It's unbelievable. Um, I used to have contact with some Australians uh, regarding uh, what they could do to be prepared, and I I did definitely warn them about the issue of heat and extreme brush fires. I can't even imagine how they could survive in a situation like that if the grid goes down. That's going to be almost catastrophic for some of those people. Well, mind you, that's true of the whole American South. I mean, uh, we have interviewed an author about six years ago who wrote about the reason that the whole movement to the Sun Belt at that time worked was due to air conditioning and take away air conditioning and there would be another movement back north again. There will be. Climate change poses an existential threat to humanity. I have written several critical articles on this topic, and the entire Southwest uh, poses to be uninhabitable um, as things continue to warm up. And, of course, if the grid were to go down, uh, that would make things that much worse that much quicker. But the real issue is going to be water supplies and wet bulb temperatures. Uh, water supplies are declining in aquifers all over the country right now. Um, I'm not sure what's happening up in Canada with the water supply, but you, you, you might be okay for a time. But here in the southwest, we have a water issue. They're constantly fighting over the Colorado River and who's going to get what allotments. And now they're being told that some farmers aren't going to get anything at all. I don't know how long that's going to last. It all has to do with rainfall and snowpack, but that's been in massive decline uh, year after year. So the issue for large segments of of the lower uh, southern United States is going to be where are they going to go? And on top of that, we have uh, accelerated melt at Greenland, Antarctica, and in the Arctic. We are going to see sea level rise that is going to indenuate the coastlines and flood out many cities all over the world. Uh, well, this is going to create a gigantic refugee problem. We haven't seen anything yet. It's just going to get significantly worse. Where do people find your past blog entries? Well, it's survivalacres.com forward slash blog. And uh, on the right side of the of the blog, there is a, um, a navigation menu uh, for some of the current articles. There's a tag cloud, or you can pick on it particular topic, uh, find all the articles related to that topic. There's over 3,000 posts on the blog, and I've been cleaning it up a little bit, so I think you'll find about 2,700 of them up there still right now. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. This is Radio Ecoshock. With your host, Alex Smith. This is Radio Ecoshock. My guest is Jonathan Richards, an old hand in the food prepper game and another witness to our race towards collapse. So I want to talk just for a minute about food reserves and national security. We know there's no big warehouses in the cities anymore. It's all in trucks rolling down the highways, the just-in-time system. And I don't think the public really is aware of how dangerous and risky that strategy is. What happens if those food trucks stop for any reason, Jonathan? (laughs) We starve, and then we we immediately devolve into chaos. It is the just-in-time system, and it's been said within the industry that we are one food harvest away from collapse. Because we can transport food and ship goods all around the world right now, we can share our food supplies with countries in need, and that would include us if our harvests were to fail. However, what happens when that harvest starts to fail all over the world? And we know that's going to happen as climate change exacerbates the situation. But if we were to have a food harvest failure or a trucking failure of any kind, the supermarkets are cleaned out in a matter of hours. Um, it, would, it wouldn't be three days before we would actually see empty supermarkets all over the nation. And then people would be fighting over the basics. And water and food is going to be one of the first priorities for most people, and then medical supplies after that. Well, now get this. The United States has a strategic petroleum reserve, but I was shocked to learn the American Grain Reserve System set up by Franklin Roosevelt 
was abolished by the 1996 Freedom to Farm Act. So Americans do not have a national grain reserve. Even the ancient Egyptians knew to store grains against a bad harvest. So I don't understand how Americans feel that they are immune to starvation. I think it has to do with our way of life, you know, the, that so-called non-negotiable way of life. You know, we, we live a very privileged life in this country because we have easy access to pretty much anything that we might want. If you can pay for it, you can have it. And we've got convenience stores and supermarkets almost on every corner. So food has never been the priority that it once was. But back during the Great Depression, people quickly realized, you know, that having food was a very serious issue. Nowadays, people are accustomed to going to the supermarket and buying whatever they need uh, or even going out. And like you mentioned earlier, you know, they don't even cook anymore. This sets up an incredible dependency that if there's any failure in the system to provide food to people within cities, villages, and towns all over this country, all over Canada, all throughout the world, what are they going to do? And this is why having food on hand is just a smart idea. You can stay home. You can stay out of the chaos. You can stay out of the rioting. You can stay out of the the conflicts that, that could occur when people start fighting over basic essentials like food or even water. In contrast to America, half of all world grain reserve stocks are held in China. China began a buying spree around 2013, uh, according to my research, as part of their national security plan. And so when we hear the world has enough grain to last just over two months, and that was a U.N. statistic back from 2012, we have to remember that 99% of my listeners will be shut out from half of those grain reserves. There's no way China's going to be sending it over to America, I don't think. So we really only have about one month ready in case volcanoes blow and cause a, a global cooling or a meteorite arrives or climate heat wipes out major crops one year. That seems so fragile. It is. Uh, We're very short-sighted when it comes to personal preparedness and uh, existential threats like this. Increasing complexity has all kinds of vulnerabilities and trigger points, and the civilization that we have built is incredibly complex. It is very dependent upon the supply of everything from, you know, fuel for the trucks farmers harvesting and uh, distributing their goods just in time to supermarkets being able to make that stuff available for human consumption. But it extends far beyond just our food systems. It's everything within our society now has become incredibly interlinked and interdependent. And that is nice for a modern way of life, but it does increase the possibility of something going wrong. I miss Lester Brown. He was the founder of the World Watch Institute, and then he founded Earth Policy Institute. At age 85, he retired a couple of years ago. He used to make phone calls available for reporters, and I tuned into them on how much grade we have and what we can expect in the coming harvest, what the problems were. Now it's almost impossible to find out how near the edge we are. China keeps its big grain reserve secret. The other big grain trader, like Cargill, It's a very private multinational corporation. Those deals for grains are done in secret. We know how much carbon is in the atmosphere, but it's a big secret how much food we have left. That is just insane to me. I think food might become the new currency of the future. Um, I've always advocated that food was much more important than things like gold or silver because you have to take your gold and silver and exchange it, usually for dollars. And then, in turn, go buy the things that you might need, whether it be fuel for your car or or something at the supermarket. You can't take gold and silver into a bank and convert it into cash. You can't take it to a supermarket. You can't take it to a gas station and convert it into the things that you need. So if food supplies become critical anywhere in the world, food will become the new currency, a means of exchange, because we've got 7.7 billion people on this planet And as you know, they've projected that it's going to go to 9 and then 10 and then 11. Well, under climate change, nutritional content of food declines. It doesn't improve. And we've already maximized all of our available growing lands and techniques and methodologies. They are attempting to make more drought-resistant crops. But with increased temperatures, we're going to see a nutritional decline and crop failures. That, that's pretty much a given. You haven't yet mentioned some of the crop failures that have happened. You know, Mongolia lost 
huge amounts of, uh, of cattle and, and livestock. Uh, Russia lost a number of crops. And when this happens, our just-in-time global delivery system is able to generally ship in supplies and prevent massive starvation. But that is yet another point of potential failure. Something that hasn't been brought up yet is we are expected to lose 95% of the world's seaports because of sea level rise. So how are we going to ship this, this grain around when that happens? This is part of the threat that people haven't really given a lot of consideration to. And unfortunately, I haven't even seen a, a science papers that really target this in the detail that I think that they should. I haven't seen it either. It's a new point to me, and I'll have to think about that angle. I do know that when the Soviet Union stopped shipping food and oil to Cuba, the Cuban government managed the local food revolution. Even the city of Havana broke out Victory Gardens to start feeding itself. So I'm wondering, maybe Americans or Europeans or Australians could do something similar in a collapse situation. I've actually read a few studies regarding the Cuba revolution, uh, regarding what they actually went through and how difficult it really was to pull this off. And they had a very fertile climate. Most Americans uh, in particular, and probably most Canadians, do not live in such a climate. And it's, it's actually quite unlikely we could do this. We don't have the land, the space, the resources, the time, sometimes even the water. Seed germination has to occur at a certain specific time, and if you miss that window, you, you're not going to get a harvest. As I said before, the food that I've grown here, I've discovered that if I was trying to rely upon my own efforts, and I've, I've expended an enormous amount of time trying to raise food here, I would have starved to death. I, I, I could not do it. Um, and no one here in my family could have done it either. There might be a few hardy souls around that have uh, more of a dedication than, than I had available. But I think that in reality that, that most people will discover that growing their own food, at best, they're going to grow just a small percentage of what they actually consume. Well, if the system breaks down by degrees and we can get a fraction of what we need from the food system still, say, handed out, Maybe what we could grow locally could help us. And certainly what I grow here on my own property is more nutritious, I think, than what's been stored for a month coming out of California or Mexico. So there's still reasons to grow. And, of course, it's it's good and healthy for our minds to be growing some food. Oh, well, absolutely. I'm an organic farmer myself uh, or a gardener. And uh, when I do have to buy something from the supermarket, I do the same thing. I buy everything that I possibly can that's organic because I'm, I'm concerned about what I'm eating. But I'm only supplementing my actual food supply by what I can grow here. Uh, the big issue for nu nutritionally dense food is going to be the grain crops. And in this area where I live, and in fact everywhere I've, I've ever been, um, I can't grow sufficient crops. So that becomes a real issue. We are really highly dependent upon the survival of civilization and the industrial agricultural food system to provide the actual nutritional calorie density that we require to maintain the populations that we have. And even if population were to somehow dramatically reduce, you know, it, it could actually happen through pandemic, uh, massive catastrophe of some sort, you know, a war situation we would have great difficulty still trying to feed the remaining population without industrial agriculture. When I went out to get my wheat to store, I had a hard time finding any. I called up the supermarkets. Of course, they sell flour. They don't sell unground wheat berries. And uh, I called up another agricultural supplier, and he said, yeah, sure, would you like one boxcar or two? Because <laughs> that's the volume that they sell at, and I would have liked to just gone up there with a couple of big bags and got whatever leaked out of the boxcar. I eventually <laughs> found a very small local granary that could sell it to me, and uh, I put it in buckets. But I think, as I told you in email, I put it in kind of the wrong kind of buckets. They're so hard to open, I would need an axe to get these buckets open again. It's not easy starting from the ground up when you don't know what you're doing. Are there particular books or other resources you could recommend for people to get started to educate themselves on this subject? Well, you know, years ago I used to read read a bunch of those books, and I've got a bunch of them in my library. But for personal preparations, 
there's a number of, of websites uh, that you would have to find for yourself. I don't have any I can recommend off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry about that. But practical preparation is, is actually not that hard. It's not really much different than buying what you are already buying at the supermarket, except that you're focused more on foods that have a long shelf life and foods that have been properly packaged. There is a Hollywood myth that I'll cover right here that indicates that, you know, the survivors of the apocalypse are going to be consuming food out of abandoned supermarkets, you know, decades later. And that, that is complete baloney. Most of those foods will have rotted or spoiled. There is a good website called stilltasty.com that will tell you what the shelf life of supermarket food is. And it's two to five years. After that, um, it's either spoiled or unfit to eat, or you're definitely at some kind of a risk uh, from either nutritional decline or even really, in worst case scenario, botulism. So most of the food in the supermarkets would have completely disintegrated or, or gone moldy or gone bad, um, even the canned food. It doesn't last as long as people seem to think. So stocking up with that sort of stuff, it's fine if you rotate it and eat it frequently, but don't plan on stocking your, your, you know, your bunker with a huge supply of canned food and then going down there 12 years later and, and expecting to eat it. You probably won't be able to. Then there's the whole issue of being mentally prepared. You know, people are so out of touch with physical reality. If the grid goes down, iTunes doesn't work, there's going to be a lot of stunned human beings looking around when their phones don't work. So what do you think about mental preparation? Are there things that we could or should be doing? I think there's a great deal that we need to be doing in this area. Um, There's been some recent studies, and, and they kind of followed some blog posts that I put up, Americans in particular, and I suppose Canadians may fall into this same group, spend over seven hours a day staring at a screen. This is an enormous amount of time waste. You know, that's that's life that you don't get back. You know, just trying to stay abreast of what's going on and following your Twitter feed or your your Facebook post or whatever it is that you're looking at. Mental preparation requires you to take responsibility and authority for your own life, and, and that of your own survival. And we take so much of this for granted. You know, we, we assume the water's going to run from the water tap. We, we assume that we're going to always be able to stay warm and dry. We assume there's going to be food in the fridge as long as we do X, Y, and Z. And that would be go to work, come home, pay your bills, buy food. Well, that makes you 100% dependent upon the survival of civilization. And that is nothing ever goes wrong. And That's kind of a dangerous way in which to live your life. And when there's been a disaster, like a hurricane or a tornado or an ice storm or something that's taken place and has affected large numbers of people, they get a really rude awakening of how unprepared they really were for something to happen. That that is that personal collapse that is taking place suddenly in their lives. But if they had taken the time to prepare in advance to make basic essential preparations They would have a plan, and they would have the essential supplies that would get them through that period of time. Right. It's getting through a certain period. I know this with growing crops. For example, if I could get my tomatoes through the frost that usually comes at the 1st of September, I can be harvesting tomatoes right into late October sometimes around here. So I need to be ready to cover up for that one little period. And I think it's the same with the whole food situation that Things may regroup, or they probably will if we have some deep troubles, but you need to get through a week, two weeks, maybe a month at least with your own food supplies. Yes. The biggest issue is nobody knows how long their individual personal collapse is going to take place. You could lose a job and then be out of work literally for several years, and that actually happened to me. And and I was able to get through it without any trouble because I had a, a fairly large food supply. And food was never an issue. And even when one of my kids said, hey, <laughs> we're getting hungry, uh, it wasn't any kind of an issue at all. But being prepared for the duration is one thing. But also, don't be naive about your preparations. There was a big movement for people to buy garden seeds, you know, that they were able to stock away and put into these number 10 cans and be like, this is going to take care of me when when the need arises. But the reality is it takes months for those seeds to come uh, to germinate and to come into harvest where you can harvest the crops. And if something were to go wrong, 
And in all honesty, it usually does. You don't always get quite the harvest that you think you're going to get. Then your your planning to eat that harvest uh, could literally go up in smoke. So, you know, you've got to be able to get yourself through any periods of time that might happen to you or to someone that you're trying to help. And I was like, that story you told us about the, the fellow in that trailer, you know, two months, was it enough? Yeah, well, then, after the two months, he actually got his government pension. He, he turned 65. He got some money, and uh, then he got into a old folks home. And so they started feeding him, and, and uh, he did survive. That's the happy ending to that story. Jonathan Richards, are you still in the survival food business yourself? No. No. Um, I, I wound up stepping back a couple of years ago, um, and I, I literally gave the company away. I, I work there for free, and that's about all I do these days. I maintain the website, and I uh, answer the emails and process the orders. You know, um, we, we did an, an arrangement with the company. I had a, a major surgery, and they, they offered to uh, help me pay for my medical bills um, in exchange for this service that I'm giving them. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened because, as I said, the whole industry has seriously collapsed. So I'm still here, still helping, um, doing what I can. And primarily these days, I just continue to research and blog about climate change. I've got some projects that I'm working on that I'm trying to promote uh, so that people can be better prepared. I'm kind of a doomer when it comes to this particular topic. I think that we're, we are seriously underestimating the ex- existential threat of what is going to happen to us uh, in regards to climate change. In your blog resolution for 2019, you said, I want to save the world. Talk to us about that. (laughs) Well, it's the truth. I'm a new grandpa. And as a result of that, you know, my perspective of things has changed in ways that I I couldn't even fathom before. I'm absolutely terrified for my grandson and the future that he is facing. Um, Of all people, I know a lot about what's unfolding and that's only because I've spent, you know, literally decades now uh, studying the topic. Uh, it doesn't make me an expert. Uh, it makes me opinionated about what I think is going to happen. And the young people of the world are becoming more and more aware and even more and more frightened about well, what future they're going to have. And from what I know about it, they are going to have an incredibly difficult time. Um, I honestly believe that their very survival is at stake. And so one of the projects that I have worked on is called the Life Project, and it is an initiative uh, on a global scale to try to account for reduced human survival. And I do believe that we have issues affecting the future of humanity and the survival of our species that have yet to really come to the forefront. The recent UN report mentioned that we had like 12 years to solve climate change, but I will argue uh, strongly that the solving of climate change may not be possible, uh, that we are going to have to uh, uh, adapt ourselves, if possible, to survive what is coming. Is there anything else that you would like to tell our listeners or to talk about with me? Well, we've covered most of it, I think. Um, I've got quite a few articles that, that deal with all of these topics and many, many more available for those who might be interested uh, to to read it up on the blog. And that is uh, survivalacres.com forward slash blog. And that's where the primary blog articles are at. I have put up some blog articles up on the food assets blog page too, but nowhere near as many. And I'm open to uh, people that want to talk or want to email and ask questions, that sort of thing. Um, I'm trying to help people as much as I possibly can because I think that we need to really sit up and pay very close attention to what's unfolding now. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. Are you a Radio Ecoshock listener? I am. Yep, I've been following you for several years. I mean, I appreciate the opportunity, Alex. This has been great. Um, I haven't allowed any interviews. I was counting the days, and it was 23 years. You're kidding me. No. Um, we, we were reached out to by ABC and CNN and, oh gosh, I can't even remember all of them, but all the, all the big namers, um, had reached out to us during the Mayan calendar run up and even back during Y2K. Uh, I've been in this a long time 
And I pretty much just refused all media interviews of any kind. Um, and I wasn't kidding that I made a special exception for you. The anonymity is part of it that I, I wanted to maintain. Plus, I wasn't really happy with how I've seen other media sources uh, distort the whole concept of people being prepared. Yeah. They, they, they may they ridicule it. I agree. Uh, they They sensationalize it, but they do it in kind of a snide way that look at these weird people. I mean, I'm just like anybody else. You know, I, I live just like anybody else. You know, I don't have a bunker. I don't have a retreat. I have a homestead. And um, I carved it out of out of the forest, literally. And then I put in a road and I built a house and did the greenhouse, the cistern and the garden and everything else, and all in the root cellar. And that doesn't make me strange. But as time went on, I, I got away from the whole prepping meme and really started focusing on the whole climate change as the existential risk. And this is why the blog has so much on that topic, because I think it is the number one issue facing humanity now. Yes. We can get through, we can get through almost everything else, but not this. But I, I don't believe that, that governmental leaders are, are going to act decisively. I don't think they're going to do it. They're not going to be allowed to do it. I think that we are more or less going to wind up being on our own. And so uh, ultimately, I'm not looking for what you might call governmental leadership. Um, I think it's going to become a private effort for how are humans going to survive what's coming. But we have to fast forward years into the future. You know, right now, we can go outside, we can breathe the air, we can stand in the sunshine. We're not dying from the heat. We're not starving to death. But fast forward years into the future when wet bulb temperatures are so darn hot that all the plants start dying, then what? You know, that's the future that the grandkids uh, and their kids, if there are any, are going to be facing. And this terrifies me. I don't know if this has happened to you, but my grandson is just over a year old. And right after he started to, you know, develop a little bit of his personality, after a couple of months, things really changed for me about how I felt about the future. It's like, I don't want to see humans go extinct, but I think the possibility is fairly high that we will. We need to do something, and because I'm not a defeatist. I absolutely do not believe in just giving up. I think we need to do everything we can, and so shows like yours are really critically important. We've got to keep getting the word out. I've been wondering about the future of Radio EcoShock. Um, and since I've got you on the phone, I'll just ask, um, what, what do you see the future? Well, I had planned a couple of years ago to start uh, helping several other people take it over. So I had my eyes out for other uh, broadcasters who are younger, and uh, I've talked to a couple of them actually about this. One is in Australia, another one's in Northern California. But the problem that's arose is a weird one. Because I've been doing this for 13 years and I've talked to so many scientists, I've actually kind of developed an education in climate science. And that's hard to replace. I haven't found somebody yet who can do that. But I think that will be the future is that I'll start doing maybe one interview a show and somebody else will do the other one. And then I'll do one interview every now and then and somebody else or a group of somebody else will take it over. Because I don't want to just let that chain of 100 stations drop out or this whole idea of, of, of climate education drop out. I've closed my blog a couple of times, mostly because I've gone broke and I've been frustrated. But then I realized, again, you know, I have to keep trying, and that's going to be my unasked for advice to you. Even though you may have just 100 and uh, a small uh, listening audience, uh, don't think things can't just suddenly turn around because they definitely could. You know, um, it, it's going to take one media outlet, one major media outlet, to make mention of something like Radio Week to Shop or, or a specific program or just something like that to get it out into the hands of millions. And then, boom, people will start asking you, to, you know, can we cover your show? It could be. I think the other possibility, what I really expect, is that I'll be totally co-opted by larger media when enough people become aware of climate change that they want more information. And then it'll become part of the nightly weather forecast and there'll be more news stories on it and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, and I've, I've got a completely different take on what needs to be done. 
I know I'm, if you've read the blog, I, I definitely believe that we need to downsize immediately. You know, we need to do a lot less, not more. Uh, we need to abandon a lot of the things that have created climate change. And I mean, yesterday. But I also realize that we won't do it. It's it's probably never going to happen. Well, it may happen. Some, I mean, the French Revolution did happen. Nobody expected it, and uh, the Industrial Revolution happened, and nobody expected that. So it's possible there will be a large motion in human affairs. But as you say, the science is pretty clear that. We've left it far too long, and so we are going to be hammered by climate disruption. But that doesn't mean that we won't uh, regroup a few times. I mean, Rome fell, and then, but there was a new Rome in Byzantium, and uh, things tend to regroup. So I'm thinking that humans may survive, although I'm just now reading more and more about 95% of the insects in uh, Central American rainforests are gone when people go back to measure them. Uh, the same in German nature preserves, the insects are gone. So um, there may be things happening at lower levels, even at the bacterial level, that that we're really not aware of that uh, will come around and bite us as well as climate change. I've been thinking about, you know, for the planet to lose this much ice, for example, you know, the, the energy imbalance that is taking place. You know, and I'm not a scientist. I don't try to come off as one. But it's kind of human hubris to assume that we're going to somehow find a way to restore that energy imbalance. You know, it, this has been set in motions for uh, hundreds of years now. This isn't something that happened in the 1970s or the 1940s. You know, this has been going on a long time. Uh, ever since we started, you know, changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere. And causing, you know, all of this energy imbalance that's taking place. And we're never going to get that ice back, ever. As, as far as humans are concerned, it's never going to happen. I mean, we would have to be looking forward, you know, to 100,000 years or so. Climate stabilization won't happen for quite a long time. But our ability to survive here uh, under these increasingly dangerous conditions for human survival um, it's the wet bulb temperature that's going to get us, and not from heat stroke, from starvation. We are going to lose our food supply first. We have been talking with Jonathan Richards. His Survival Acres blog has been influential for me. I've been reading it, and for many others. And I will put links for this discussion in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Thank you so much for chatting with us, Jonathan. I've really enjoyed it. Alex, I appreciate the call. Thank you for the chance to, to share what's happening. Take care. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. In the new carbon-charged world, you are listening to Radio EcoShock, broadcast around the world on radio and the Internet. Find Radio EcoShock on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, the weekly show blog at EcoShock.org. Tune in. Turn on. Turn on.